Welcome to this lecture on cardiac contractile cells. After this lecture, you will be able to describe the general structure of cardiac contractile cells, also known as cardiomyocytes, describe the mechanism of electrical conductance in cardiac contractile cells, and you will be able to describe the cardiac contractile cell potential graph. Firstly, we will briefly discuss the structure of cardiomyocytes. Cardiomyocytes are branched in shape, as you can see here. And they are also uninucleate, which means they only have one nucleus per cell. Also, between each of the cardiomyocytes, there are structures called intercalated discs, which include other structures called gap junctions and desmosomes, which aid in either the uh, transfer of electrical signals or the transfer of force between these cells. When we look closer into the cardiomyocyte, we see different channels and receptors and other structures that are important in the release of calcium, the reuptake of calcium, the propagation of the action potential, and eventual contraction of the cardiomyocyte. So first, the L-type channels, which are located along the sarcolemma of the cardiomyocyte, are voltage-gated calcium channels. And so they are going to let calcium into the cell when they are activated, activated by an action potential. Next, the ryanodyne receptor is located on the on a calcium channel along the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the cell. So the ryanodyne receptor, also when it is activated by a potential, it is going to um, open up the calcium channel and let calcium um, into the sarcoplasm of the cell uh, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Next, the sarcopump is also located along the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but it does the opposite of the, um, the ryanodyne receptor calcium channel. It is going to let calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and lastly, the T-tubule is a extension of the, sarco, uh, of the sarcolemma, um, which it looks kind of like a fold, and it is important for um, uh, transferring, or uh, it's important for the propagation of the action potential uh, kind of into the cell. And uh, I actually did not include it here, but along the T-tubule, there's going to be a, uh, another receptor called the DHP receptor, which is going to be important for um, really transferring the action potential to the uh, ryanodyne receptor eventually. So this is a general mechanism of the, um, uh, of the contraction of cardiac contractile cells. So it all starts with a pacemaker cell um, which is going to propagate an action potential um, to an adjacent cardiac contractile cell um, so through the gap junction. So the gap junction is important for uh, transferring that electrical signal or action potential to the cardiac contractile cell. So once the action potential travels along the sarcolemma, in step two, it's going to activate a L-type voltage-gated calcium channel right here. And it's going to let in um, calcium into the sarcoplasm, the, the sarcoplasm of the cell. In step three, the action potential is going to propagate along the T-tubule. So once it does, it's going to reach um, a receptor called the DHP receptor, which is going to um, uh, kind of transfer that uh, action potential to uh, your ryanodyne receptors or RYR receptors, which are 
located along the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that's going to let calcium channels open in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And calcium is going to be transported into the sarcoplasm. So what does calcium do once it's in the sarcoplasm? Um, what it does is it it's going to go to the myofibril. And more specifically, it's going to go to the myofilament that has troponin. Um, so the calcium is going to bind to troponin, which is on the actin filament. And it's going to help remove the tropomyosin from the myosin binding sites on the actin filament and allow for the formation of your, your cross bridge right here between the myosin head and uh, attached to the myosin binding site on the actin filament. And so that's going to result in eventual cross bridge, cross bridge cycling and contraction. So in step eight, after the cross bridge cycling occurs, the calcium has to travel back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum as to travel back here. So in order to do that, it's going to, um, it's going to utilize the circuit pump that we spoke about earlier, which actually is going to aid in the reuptake of calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Also calcium can uh, take a different route, it can actually exit the cell itself through um, what we call uh, NACA exchangers or sodium calcium exchangers, NCX uh, pumps, uh, so that um, calcium exits the cell. So lastly, we will talk about the membrane potential graph of the uh, cardiac contractile cells. Um, and as you can see, it's uh, a lot more different, kind of similar to the potential graph of a neuron. So we have around um, five phases in total, if you include phase zero. Um, and so one difference between this graph and a potential graph for neurons is that, well, the membrane potential or the resting membrane potential is negative 90 millivolts um, compared to the negative 70 millivolts of neurons. Um, and so this is at phase four of the cell. Um, and at phase four, um, sodium and calcium channels are closed and uh, potassium rectifier channels are open. And this contributes to the resting membrane potential at negative 90 millivolts. So this upshoot that's next is phase zero. And this is when sodium um, is going to enter the cell rapidly. And um, right, I forgot to mention that beforehand, but there are voltage-gated sodium channels along the sarcolemma as well. And when the action potential reaches them, it activates um, the opening of the sodium channels. And sodium is going to come in and result in depolarization of the cell. So once the sodium um, comes into the cell, we reach a certain point of depolarization here. And at phase one, sodium channels are going to close and the potassium channels are going to open and let out potassium. So usually in the neuron potential graph, there's going to be a huge downshoot, right? There's a huge downshoot um, when, when it comes to the repolarization of the cell. But in this case, for the cardiac contractile cell, there is not going to be a huge downshoot or huge repolarization because in phase two, what happens is that calcium L-type channels are going to open up and they're going to let in calcium while potassium is going out. And this actually results in kind of a counterbalance. Um, it results in this 
plat plateau right here, this plateau. Um, and actually, this plateau is very significant for the functioning of um, cardiac muscle contraction um, because it actually attributes to the longer refractory period of the cardiac contractile cells themselves, uh, which prevents um, prolonged contractions um, or tetanus. And um, right, so we do not want our heart to be in a prolonged state of contraction because it needs to pump out blood or blood needs to fill the chambers when it relaxes. So this plateau is very significant when looking at this potential graph. And in phase three, this is where uh, basically the calcium channels close. So no more calcium coming in. And so uh, the, uh, the cell is able to um, sharply repolarize. And the slow potassium channels open. So there is a, a constant uh, efflux of potassium as well. And then we go back to phase four where calcium and sodium channels close and the potassium rectifier channels open and we are at negative 90 millivolts. So in summary, you learned after this lecture that cardiac muscle cells are uninucleate and branch shaped. They have structures called intercalated discs that include gap junctions and desmosomes, which facilitate cell conductance and contraction. Secondly, you learn that the mechanism of cardiomyocyte contraction involves several proteins and ions that aid in the propagation of the action potential and the formation of cross bridges.